Good morning. We'll go ahead and get started here. <coughs> One of the really fun parts about this job is getting to introduce some attendings that I worked with as a resident. And <clears throat> there's some really great teachers in our system and some attendings that make it a lot of fun to come to work. And today is one of those days <clears throat> introducing Dr. Goldberger. He did his medical school training at Yale before coming to the University of Washington for internal medicine residency training. He then went to the University of Michi Michigan for a cardiology fellowship where he also earned a master's degree as a Robert Wood Johnson scholar doing health services research. He then returned to the University of Washington and joined the faculty here. He is uh, assistant professor in the Division of Cardiology, the associate program director for the Cardiology Fellowship, as well as the director for the Arrhythmia and EKG Laboratory at Harborview Medical Center. The focus of his scholarship is on non-invasive electrophysiology, including some resuscitation research. He's won an award from the American Heart Association, the Max Perry Weil Award for Resuscitation Science for that work. And of national recognition, he's also on several writing committees, including the 2015 American Heart Association updated guidelines for cardiopulmonary resuscitation and emergency cardiovascular care. Also on the uh, two, 2015 guidelines writing committee for management of patients with supraventricular tachycardia and some upcoming 2016 guidelines as well for sympathy. He's here today to talk to us about clinical practice guidelines getting to the heart of the matter. Please help me welcome Dr. Goldberger. Thanks, John, for that kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I had, the, as John mentioned, I had the distinct honor and privilege of being a part of um, some recent guidelines, and I wanted to sort of focus my talk today on those guidelines. Um, now, this particular one for SVT, it was a tremendous educational experience. It allowed me to intersect two of my great interests, you know, one of which was arrhythmia, and SVT has been fascinating me forever. And um, also guideline development, which was before this experience and still is to some extent an enigmatic process. And so in preparing to be part of the committee, I wanted to sort of discuss, I, I wanted to sort of learn about the development of guidelines. And so but they've been around for many years, okay? They've been around for 2,500 years, it turns out. So this is Plato, the classical Greek philosopher, and he oftentimes you know, used di dialogues, this one's called the Statesman or Politicus, just sort of as a vehicle for explaining his philosophies and beliefs. And in this dialogue, he basically, he oftentimes Socrates, his mentor was the protagonist. But in this dialogue, Socrates basically at the beginning introduces a student of his, which is also, he's also called Socrates, and he introduces them to a visitor, a guy that just shows up. And basically, the whole dialogue is basically going to be Socrates, um, young Socrates, and, his, and this visitor having a long conversation about politics. And basically, they, you know, it's all about the idea of expertise. It's about the sort of the differences between skills that are grounded in being an expert and those based on experience. And so he sets up a thought experiment. This didn't scan well. What he's going to say is the visitor says, you know, we're going to take members of these professions and use the clinician as the model here, clinicians and sailors. They're going to be saying we're no longer going to be allowed unchecked authority. So again, they're sort of practicing as they would, but from now they're actually going to have a little bit more control. So they said, he said, what do we decide to convene ourselves into an assembly to voice an opinion about sailing and sickness? Again, these are sailors and clinicians. And once the assembly has heard all this advice, the majority decision dictates the way in which we sail and treat the sick. And so, you know, young Socrates says, well, this is very strange. He's not really understanding this. This is a novel concept at the time. And the visitor goes on to say, you know, no, no, no. Here's what I'm talking about. You know, it's our policy to appoint people to put out the written code, and that will guide us how we direct shipping and heal the sick. And young Socrates says, you know, this is more difficult to take seriously, you know. So, you know, this notion of codifying the decisions um, and sort of putting them into sort of a published work, you know, it's actually very uncommon at the time. And it's sort of, you know, it's sort of this text and many others at the time prefigures many of the impulses which animate the clinical guideline movement today. And so we're going to talk about the guidelines. You know, we're going to have a comprehensive review of SVT 
the mechanisms, ECG characteristics, therapy, and we're going to have a long discussion about the management of pre-excited atrial fibrillation. Okay? Actually, we're, that was, I thought that would be a good idea. That's not what I was asked to talk about. What we're really going to talk about is sort of we're going to have a brief history of these guidelines. And sort of take a behind the scenes look of how guidelines are developed. You know, we have them out there. We quote them all the time. But it's not, I mean, maybe it is, but to me it wasn't known actually how they came to be. We'll look at the revised format of new guidelines coming out and sort of the new revised level of evidence classifications. We'll discuss the idea of guideline durability, how guidelines come out and they're fragile. Maybe they don't carry on for years. And some of them may. We'll talk about some controversial topics that came up when we were writing the guidelines for SVT and some gaps in those guidelines that still exist now. And then at the end, we'll make a guideline. Okay? So the first guideline that came out for the ACCHA was back in 1984, it discussed the guidelines for permanent pacer implantation. It was the first ACC guideline, maybe one of the earliest guidelines to my knowledge that we have. Basically, there are 87 discrete recommendations talking about who gets a pacer, who doesn't, who may get it, but no levels of evidence assigned to those recommendations. And since that time, in 1984, for the next 25 years, there was an explosion in guidelines coming out from the ACC AHA. There's about 53 guidelines and 22 topics, about 7,200 recommendations. You know, of note, I will say that, you know, it was interesting, you know, class two recommendations actually became class 2A and 2B back in 1990, and levels of evidence were introduced not consistently until 1998. So again, it's still a process in evolution. SVT, the first iteration of the guideline, was back in 2003. Since 2010 and now even 2016, there's been even more guidelines exponentially growing, and this is not even a fraction of what's been happening in the past few years, and 2015 was the next edition of the SVT guidelines. So how are guidelines developed? And this is my experience. And so for SVT anyway, basically, you know, the ACCHA has a task force. And this is also a heart rhythm guideline. The task force would meet and decide, well, you know, we need a guideline, or we might need an update on the guideline, or we might need just a focused update. And they nominated a chairman. And the chairman for the SVT guidelines was Rick Page. And Rick Page is a, probably a, a familiar name to this crowd. He was a um, the chairman of the division when I was a resident. And so Rick was nominated as a chair, and he chose a co-chair. And then Rick and others would nominate members to the writing committee directly, and they would also accept outside nominations, which is how I came to be. They also formed the Evidence Review Committee, which is an independent body from the writing committee, which is assigned to sort of do a systematic review of a PICOS question, sort of a systematic review of a question that pertains to the topic of interest. We would meet at the kickoff meeting, usually at a national meeting. We would discuss the guideline, what was going to go in it, and, you know, guidelines are massive documents. They have a lot of recommendations and a lot of text. And I always didn't know how, you know, are we all sort of doing the right sentences and put them together? So what happens with the guidelines, and most of it, the way it is, you get assigned a section to write, one or maybe two. And you're assigned to be a primary reviewer and a secondary reviewer for others. So at first, anyway, you're assigned to sort of look at the evidence for those things, an extensive evidence review, go to these two-hour biweekly conference calls and discuss the evidence and put forth recommendations on your section. And then you would go back to the meeting and again, and you would talk about all the guidelines and take ownership of the whole document. You draft the text of the guideline, and the chairs edit the text, comes back to the writing committee, you get peer review comments. I think we had about 200 of them. And then the guideline ballots, we would vote confidentially on these guidelines online. And then the guidelines published. It, was, it took about a year and a half to do this, and it was just a tremendous experience. I want to talk about just this step, you know, the idea of, you know, I'm here talking about being a part of a writing committee, which is a real honor, you know. And so this is me, and this is how Rick Page remembers me, okay? Okay. <laughs> Oops. And this is how I look now, okay? And so, you know, I, I was flattered that Rick knew me and, you know, he remembered me. We wrote a paper together. But at the same time, you know, you know I remember being on vacation when I got the email, and I was, like, I, was really, I was really excited. And then I realized that, you know, I come from a long line of cardiologists my family, as you may know, this is Jeffrey Goldberger, who is a cardiology professor who has interest in EP and heart rhythm problems at Northwestern. I've never met Jeffrey Goldberger, okay? <laughs> I don't look like Jeffrey Goldberger, but I knew that Rick Page had written hundreds of papers with Jeffrey Goldberger, and lots of the stuff that we were researching for our guideline was written by Jeffrey Goldberger, okay? So I was like, you know, Rick, I, you know, thanks for the guideline nomination, but I, I kind of think you may have meant to, you know, send it to Dr. Goldberg. <laughs> you type in it, 
your email and it kind of auto fills, you know. And you know, he said, no, 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 you know, you're the right one. You know, I support the nomination. Um, I meant it was you, but bring it. And so that's it's kind of like finding a suitcase full of money and not knowing what to do with it. So anyway, I didn't ask any more questions after that. So I thought what we'd do it at first anyway is sort of just to talk about what is SVT, because you know, this is a question that we asked ourselves at the first meeting. And we kept asking ourselves this question about for a long time, almost until the very end. You know, we're talking about SVT or supraventricular tachycardia, but what are we talking about? You have to sort of, I think this guideline was an opportunity to define. And so hopefully, if you have clickers, and I'm hoping this works, you know, what is SVT? So this it means different things to electric cardiographers and to people who consult for this problem, but we could try to define it. So is it any tachycardia that originates above the ventricles that would include sinus tachycardia? atrial flutter with rapid conduction or atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response? Or would you say, oh, it's all nine sinus tachycardias, and that would include atrial tachycardia, AVNRT and AVRT, those are reentrant rhythms, that comes above the ventricles? Or would you say it's actually non-sinus tachycardias, including atrial tachycardia, AVNRT and AVRT, but not atrial flutter and not atrial fibrillation, or it's more like, I don't know, but I know it when I see it? So I, I think we have responses. Um, and if you have clickers, they're in the back. But we'll take a couple seconds and sort of ask yourself, you know, what do you think about? It? And this idea of defining things, that was what was great about the guidelines, I think. It's not so much about science. Um, it's not so much about staying in a hotel in a nice city. It's actually about language. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about words and what words to use. Like, we had a big debate about whether we should call it the treatment of patients or the management of patients. It actually really matters to people. You know, even MAT, which is a definition that came about in like 1980s in this paper that was described as chaotic atrial tachycardia, the definition of MAT within that single paper that described it defined it differently in the paper, text, and then in the table. So I know mean, this is, a, I thought it was really interesting that we talk about these things, but we should probably define it. And I'll say 41 responses. Okay, good. So uh, most of you think that it's any tachycardia, choice A. So there's, there is a spread. And I think that oftentimes it's D. It's hard to define. Do you recognize it? Okay. I guess the question now is, you know, if you have to, you know it when you see it, which of these is SVT? So this is a 40-year-old woman with palpitations up front. You have a 65-year-old man with shortness of breath. You have a 76-year-old man who has skipped beats. And then you have a 73-year-old woman with COPD exacerbation. Okay. I'll give you a couple seconds. And then I'll open the poll. So which of these things is SVT? Okay, let's see. Okay. Looks like many of you thought it was choice one. And that's fair. So, in fact, all these are SVTs. Okay? The first one is a paroxysmal SVT, and it's probably AVNRT. The second sinus tachycardia, there are clear P waves, for every curious complex, kind of on top of the T wave. This is an irregular, irregular rhythm, and it's rapid, so it's atrial fibrillation with RVR, there's no P waves. And then MAT is the last one, a very uncommon rhythm. But they all kind of fall under the rubric of what we, many would consider SVTs. The definition we came up with was basically you have to have a T, so more than 100 at rest. Again, is it 100 or is it above 100? That was a discussion. The mechanism involves tissue from above the bifurcation of the His bundle. That wasn't adequate because we also had these accessory pathways that were part of it, and they were up next to the His bundle. And so we also talked about forms of accessory pathway or bypass mediated reentrant tachycardias. And all the lists below, those seven or eight arrhythmias, were all the things that were considered to be SVT. And they were all discussed in the guideline. Paroxysmal SVT is what we usually think about when we're talking about SVT. You know, it used to bother me when people would say SVT, but it doesn't so much anymore because I understand the confusion. It's a subset of SVT overall. It's a syndrome. Usually one of these three things that starts and stops suddenly. And the surface ECG can give you clues about it, but it's not necessarily diagnostic of it. And the only way to really know sometimes is to stick catheters in the heart and sort of figure out what it is. But these are all the classic narrow complex PSVTs. So we were at the meeting, and then we also talked about this extreme guideline makeover. So the guidelines in the past were, were, uh, were a mess, okay? 
you know, the, the 2003 SVT guidelines look like this. This is a table, recurrent AVNRT. They would give you presentations, they give recommendations, they give you classes of evidence that weren't really in any order. There's some levels of evidence, usually it's B and C, there's no A there. And then there's references for not all, but some. So if you had this in the emergency room, I don't know what would happen, you know, because what you have here is this idea of a, a documented PSVT with only dual AV nodal pathways or single echo beats demonstrated during EP study. And what's the clinician supposed to do with that? Then you have like five medications and oh, maybe catheter ablation with a bunch of superscripts. It's a hard thing to know about when you're having, when you're faced with a patient with a narrow compass tachycardia at 190 who's becoming hypotensive, you know? So we decided that that was not sufficient anymore. And you know, starting with the valvular heart disease guidelines, they sort of laid out what was sort of now the classic way that all ACC guidelines look. What we have now is just single recommendations with text, and they're ordered and they have levels of evidence. And the text for guidelines is now different. You know, people used to ask me about what should I read before I go to fellowship. I'd say, you know what, you should probably read the guidelines because not only should you know the guidelines since you're going to be a fellow in cardiology, but actually those guidelines are great references. They're much more thoughtful written by experts, they're concise, and much better than book chapters. I don't tell people that anymore because I think that the text now is a little bit different. And for the interested evidence-based reader, if you had a question about any of the recommendations that we use to formulate these guidelines, and there's hundreds of them, it's an online data supplement, you can go and look at it in the appendix. It talks about the study, the authors, the sample size, what kind of study it was, who was included, who was excluded, all the endpoints, the safety endpoints, the limitations, and what the trial really meant. And so, it's, again, we can't talk about that at all because of the limitations on the words we can write, but it's all there. And we try to the extent possible for every disease condition and treatment strategy to have some sort of a flow chart that can be easily accessible. You can have it on your iPad too, just a quick reference. And we tried to color code it appropriately as well. The classes of recommendation. So this is the kind of thing that we kind of understand and we've been feeling with this a long time. You know, class one, yes, class two, probably, class two B, maybe, and class three is a no. You know, it's a lot more nuanced than that, and this actually took a little while for me to figure out. So, first of all, you know, I think that, you know, class three and class three, it can mean now two things. One of it's no benefit, as opposed to just causing harm. And the second thing is, it's actually a little bit more than just saying yes, probably, maybe, and no. It's a lot more nuanced than that. And I think that I learned that, you know, especially in writing the CPR guidelines when they were talking about ECGs as a 2A, if you talk to other guideline de developers, you know, 2A actually is a very strong recommendation. The strongest that I think you even have, to say something the class one, use words like is, should be. And that comes across always. Is, or can be, or may, or might be, should not. And then there's some verbs and adjectives you use, you know, is recommended, reasonable. And I think that it's hard, you know, you have to sort of put this up in your bulletin board when you're writing these guidelines, because you have an idea about what you want to say. Like, well, I have a drug, and I know I want to use this drug to treat AVNRT or something. But, you know, should I, is it necessary or is it reasonable to do that? It takes a long time. And so it kind of also, you know, doing this, it kind of consumes your life. You know, the other guideline developers in the room who could probably attest to that. But it becomes part of your daily parlance, how you speak, you know. So I would say, you know, to my wife, oh, we, you know, we, our babies need a bath tonight. You know, we should give them a bath. <laughs> we need to give our babies a bath. You know, it's recommended. They need one. But that really says, like, you know, if we don't give them a bath, they're going to come and take them away from us. You know, class one, and we didn't do it. <laughs> we're at fault. So you can say, you know what? That's, that's too much. You know, it's, I think it's reasonable to give them a bath. You know, they haven't had one in a week. You know, they're not happy. I think it's reasonable. It'll be beneficial, and it'll probably be effective. You know? you know, they're in a bad mood. So, you know, it might be reasonable. We could probably, you know, consider it, but I'm not really sure. It's not really going to help. They're not going to like it. And then in class three, like, you, know, you can't do that. You're not going to do that. You're going to get hurt, and suddenly you have no benefit, okay? So again, in class one and class three, again, this is really hard to say because the class, if you look at guidelines, there's not a lot of class ones, there's not a lot of class threes because actually that actually matters. It's what you're recommending. It actually plays into a legal context as well. So you have, if you're doing something that's recommended, is recommended means a lot more than is reasonable. And I suspect that in the future, as guidelines continue to evolve exponentially, this may be not sufficient. You may have class 1A, class 1B, we may even have a class five in there somewhere. This is limited, but it's the framework that we're using. The levels of evidence are, a lot, I think, much more helpful, and it's actually what I pay attention to more when I'm dealing with the guideline. So level A, as we understand, is multiple populations, multiple RCTs or randomized or meta-analyses of such RCTs, 
Level B, single populations, maybe one RCT, lots of observational data. Level C is kind of the thing that we always get very skeptical of. This is the idea that these guys are sitting in the back room of cigars who are plotting to overtake the world with their expert opinion. This is what the idea that Plato was talking about at the time. But also case studies and standards of care that were out there. This is the way I practice. This is the way I want the world to practice. We actually thought that was not very helpful. And so beginning with SVT, we revised the levels of evidence. And now it's, you have a level B, which actually still is level B, but it's codified into BR, which is RCTs, but not as strong as A, with observational data, BNR. We had level E to talk about extra opinion, and that got to be confusing. So we said that C should be two. So now there's CLD, which is things that are limited in design. There's not a lot of data out there. Some are me you know, mechanistic studies. And the EO is the thing that we are sort of try to avoid and be cautious of, this idea of expert opinion. Um, insufficient, vague, or conflicting evidence. And so one of the things that we took pride in, and Rick was adamant about this, is that you know, if you had a recommendation that made a lot of sense, and you, had, you couldn't find evidence for it, you say it's a CEO, he said, just look harder. You have to find some data. So there's no evidence-only recommendation, levels of evidence in the guideline. So the question is, are these guidelines durable? So you have a lot of guidelines, there's 7,200 recommendations. How far does recommendations actually hold water for? So if you look at sort of just a small sample of some of the guidelines that came out before 2010, 11 of them, and these are all guidelines that were updated, you know, five or six years afterwards. Taking a look at them, it's actually very interesting to see that, you know, that in the index guideline from 1998, valvular disease, going down to coronary disease in women, you know, 80% of those guidelines that were class one were retained in the subsequent iteration of the guideline, be it an update, or down the road. But a non-trivial number were actually downgraded. So they were class ones and became class two A. And some of them actually just weren't even discussed at all. They were omitted from subsequent iterations without much of an explanation as to why that was. And this is problematic and actually very inspiring to some extent. And the reason is this. Not only are we able to sort of sort of reappraise the evidence that we have. And so if you say that if you go from a class one A or a class one to class two A, I mean, it's the same evidence that sort of developed those guidelines, so how is that possible? And I think that actually what we're doing is, you know, reappraising the evidence that we had, which is a very, that's actually, that's what science is. So you're taking evidence that you had before and looking at it again with fresh eyes. A lot of this may have to do with the fact that the writing committee for an index guideline may not be the same people as wrote the update. It may be, you know, 11 people to 33, and the chairs may sort of see things differently. And you're sort of colored by the culture and, and the new technologies that you're sort of dealing with. I will say, though, that, you know, of all these things that were retained, you had a one in eight chance of being downgraded if you were a class A evidence. Or, sorry, one in eight if you were a class B or below. And a far likelihood of, of being retained, one in 26, one in 25%, a 3% chance if you're a class A. So, again, we tend to value class A evidence. And class one recommendations are oftentimes class A, but there are very few class one recommendations that actually are A. So that's something to sort of consider moving forward. Now, looking at some guidelines that actually came out that were downgraded, you know, several of them from the ischemic heart disease guidelines that had several iterations, PCI. You know, a lot of these things were class one, and they became class two A. And the levels of evidence oftentimes stayed the same, and oftentimes they were upgraded and downgraded. And again, this is sort of just a revision of sort of how you look at data. So PCI after successful thrombolysis should be performed at the class one language. If there's a current evidence of the MI, that was class one level of B. And then all of a sudden, as time went on, we're saying that's reasonable to do that. And the level of evidence that was actually stronger became downgraded. I think just by looking at that again. I think it would be a very interesting project if somebody wanted to look back at the guidelines that were before CEO and LD and say, you know, it was just A, B, and C, and say, well, what does that really C really mean? So look about how many of those recommendations actually were limited data or expert opinion. Because again, levels of evidence were introduced, they've been modified, and now they're different, they're now they're different moving forward. The study guidelines came out in the European Society in 2012, and there's about 164 recommendations. And several weeks later, in 2013, the Americans had a similar guideline. MI is fatal. Far fewer recommendations, but overall, if you take a look at this, the breakdown, it's actually very similar. You know, we had, you know, there's a slightly higher level of class threes in 2013 at the expense of in class twos, but overall, if you have an MI in France and an MI in Seattle, 
you would expect to be treated the same way based on the classes of evidence. That may not be the case because if you look closely at the classes of evidence, you know, for as far as class 1A evidence, the pinnacle, the American societies had 19% out of a lot of recommendations that were class 1A, and the Europeans had 24%. You know, that may be seem like a very trivial number, but it's actually quite significant. If you're thinking about the way you're going to have treatment done in France, maybe actually very different if you're practicing guideline-based medicine, you have it in the States. And there may be reasons for this. I mean, I think that, you know, it's different target audiences, they have different resources, they have different therapies. But overall, it would be much more reassuring if we had everything exactly the same way. As an example, if you look at acute pharmacotherapy or for primary PCI, if you're going to the cath lab, what are you going to get? get, going to get? You know, you only have about you know, sort of eight options, all the things here. And there's only concordance in about four of them. Aspirin, upstream 2B3As, which you don't really do much anymore. Heparin, and the idea of getting fondaparinox is a class three because it causes catheter thrombosis in the cath lab. But again, it would be nice if check boxes weren't on all those things. Okay? So going to the cath lab in Europe, you're going to have a different experience than going in the United States. Looking at SVT and the durability of those guidelines, you know, we had basically the same number of recommendations in 2003 and 125. We don't have a lot more ways to fix ECGs, to put it bluntly. You know? There's about only two more recommendations that we have in 2015. And overall, it's about the same. They had about maybe you know, six or seven more class threes, and we only had about three in our guideline. But overall, it's about the same. And looking at levels of evidence, it's hard to say what that really means because it's been different, now different. You know, we have this sort of strata of Bs and Cs that we didn't back then. But overall, you can see that you know, class A recommendations in the dark blue at 6% in 2003, we only have one class A recommendation in the guideline for SBT now. I'm looking at what happened. So we have several class 1As older than before, talking about adenosine, Rapamil and you know, transesophageal pacing, which was a class 1A, and now it's a class CLD. We don't even talk about transesophageal pacing. Those were all downgraded. Okay? They were once class A, and now they're just BR, which is interesting. And the only one recommendation that we have is, you can sort of get an idea of what it might be, but the idea of using oral dofetilide or IV ibutilide is useful for the acute pharmacologic conversion of atrial flutter. Okay, now I can tell you that you know this is this is a class one A. You know it's in the guidelines. I've done this several times in my career, and it's worked a lot. You know, but every time I've done it, the entire ward came to watch, and they would nurses would have their PSNs ready to fire off. <laughs> and like, who is this guy? You know, where did you get this guy? What are they doing? What are they doing in Michigan? You know, and they came to watch. You know, it took about four hours to get the drug. You hang it over about a minute, uh, ten minutes, a milligram. And after about seven minutes, it works, and everyone's would start to applaud, you know. <laughs> and it just gives you an idea that, you know, we could say, oh, well, the guidelines is 1A, but we don't do this a lot. So it's kind of hidden there. I think it's sort of interesting, you know, this is about best clinical practice. It's something that we could do only a fraction of the time. So there were some controversies that came up. You know, you see, you get a bunch of electric cardiographers in a room, you're not going to agree on everything. Now you've even heard stories that when the Europeans and the Americans get together, for instance, for heart failure, there would be lots of arguments. You know, let's take this outside. It wasn't that quite that contentious with the SVTs because we tried to keep it together. But one of the things we didn't, just, we didn't agree about was the idea of antiarrhythmics for SVT. Okay, so catheter ablation, many of these arrhythmias are very, pretty much a cure to ablate something with a catheter. A lot of them are recommendations that are class one, you know, oftentimes B to give a catheter ablation. And the role of antiarrhythmics for AVNRT, here we talk about flecainide and propafenone, these taboo 1C agents that we're worried about based on older data that shows that it actually could kill people. And then class 3 agents which are potentially torsogenic. Giving those drugs versus catheter ablation may be deemed unsafe. One of the things that we talked about was whether these should both be class 2B. Because of the superiority of catheter ablation and the efficacy versus giving drugs that are potentially toxic. Same thing with flutter. And this is not the way that I tend to practice and I think that my colleagues would say that, you know, I think that giving strength and very strong evidence to amiodarone and dofetilide and solol for atrial flutter is far inferior, and not as best practice as saying this they should have an ablation. And again, flecainide is kind of reverse for AVNRT, but again, it's also indicated and recommended perhaps if they're not really a candidate for ablation, which is actually kind of a hard thing to be. We have a recommendation for catheter ablation and lots of things in the guidelines. You know, in 2015, 
we have this tucked away at the end of the guideline, you know, class 2B CLD. It says that catheter ablation may be reasonable for patients who are asymptomatic who have recurrent atrial flutter. So somebody comes in, they don't have any symptoms, but they have atrial flutter, you've cardioverted them, they go back into it again later, they're probably on anticoagulation. And the question is, you know, you know, why not just get rid of it? You know, we had a patient like this in clinic the other day. And the question is, you know, what the guidelines say? Well, they say, you know, it's actually, you can consider ablating it because it might be effective. But you don't have to, it's not class one. It may not even be reasonable, class two A. So there's no recommendation at all, this was actually not part of it, for ablation in a patient who comes in asymptomatic with not recurrent but newly diagnosed flutter. And they're rate controlled. And, you know, you, you come in with an ECP like this in clinic, everyone's kind of high-fiving because the atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter is such a hard thing to rate control. They walk in, they're already rate controlled and flutter, they feel fine. And the question is, well, they have it, you know, should we ablate it or just let them ride? They're rate controlled already. Maybe you want to continue that. Or you can consider cardioverting them and watching out what happens. So the question is, you know, do we ablate these patients? And this actually came up again in clinic just the other day. They walked in with the CCG. And so I guess you could look at the evidence. There's lots of arguments. So you have this trial that was done um, in 2000. They looked at 60 patients and they randomized. What they concluded was that ablation of typical flutter, and that's just the way the, P, the flutter rays are polar, and the way they look like, look like on the ECG, typical versus atypical, associated with a lower recurrence rate compared to cardioversion and medical therapy. And what they found was that ablation was superior. Far more patients remained in sinus after ablation, not 100%, but a lot. There are patients who actually needed more than one hospitalization if they were just kept on medications. A lot of patients developed atrial fibrillation, which is mechanistically different from a close cousin of atrial flutter, and they oftentimes coexist. And the patients tended to have, they felt better after they got ablated. They felt better, they had better functioning, and they actually didn't change in patients who were on drugs, they felt the same. So it's a pretty good argument for saying that we probably should ablate these guys as opposed to just cardioverting them and keeping them on rate control. And looking at the guidelines, we would say that the success rate for atrial flutter is actually pretty high. And in fact, it is a very low complication rate. You know, we have better electrodes now, we have contact force sensing, 3D mapping, all of these actually makes ablation a much higher, higher success enterprise as time's gone on. 10.6 atrial flutter was quoted in the guidelines. This is based on a 2009 meta-analysis. I think that, you know, I see one of my electrophysiology colleagues in the audience, and I think that if you have a 10% recurrence rate, it's actually a very memorable event. I don't think it's anywhere near this high. But that's what we're dealing with. And so now you say, well, you know, I'm not really sure if I want to bleed because what we're really trying to do, you know, we're going to have an invasive procedure, and you may not even get off anticoagulation, which is a big problem for some patients. You know, in fact, Looking at some data that show that you know well, about 400 patients that were studied, most of them had isolated flutter, but some of them developed new fib after a successful ablation, or that was fib that was there but just not recognized. And so you're not really going to get off anticoagulation if you have, you know, atrial fibrillation that still exists. And I think that oftentimes we're forced to sort of monitor patients. Maybe have this sort of false sense of security that well the flutter's gone, they could be off warfarin, but not if they have fib. So it's not necessarily that beneficial if your patient doesn't really want to be on anticoagulation. And finally, it's not really a risk-free enterprise. So the ablation that happens in the cavotricuspid isthmus, that sort of supplies posterior inputs to the AV node. So you can actually walk out of the EP lab with a pacemaker. It's not very common, but looking at this small study, not small, it's about 1,300 patients, looking at them below 70 and, 70 and above, lots more complications than the patients that were above 70, and a lot more occurrence than those that were under it. And as far as death goes, they quoted a 9.3 death rate perioprocedurally in patients who had flutter ablations above the age of 70 and 5% even under 70. That doesn't sound acceptable to me at all. And as far as walking out of that with a pacemaker, you expect that 15% of patients above 70 actually walked out with a pacemaker. Why would that be the case? It's hard to know. You know, I don't know if it was a complication, but they actually did some more work to say that if your heart rate is below 65 when you walk in the EP lab, you may walk out with a pacemaker. Higher likelihood ratio of actually having that happen Heart's above 65. And we had a patient like this the other day who I sent for a flutter ablation. He came out of the, came out of the cardioversion with a heart rate of 30, hypotensive. It had to be admitted for that. So again, it's not necessarily risk-free. So now we have some evidence. I presented it somewhat, okay? And there's a few studies, and there's obviously there's more, and I didn't give you a lot of data. But you know, based on what you know now, and I'm going to take this back to the update, okay, based on what you say, 
What do you say about catheter ablation and newly diagnosed asymptomatic father? You say it's recommended, class one. It's reasonable to do. It's considered. Or it's not recommended. What would you say based on what I told you? And that was what guidelines basically were. You would sort of put forth a recommendation and say, this is the evidence that I found. And you have to go back to the evidence and say, that really wasn't a good study. There were complications with that study. I don't want to throw out that study. So I have different evidence. And then based on that, those two-week phone calls, those two hours, you make a recommendation and talk about it at the meeting. You say, I have a recommendation, and people might like that and might not. And I'd like to see, I'm going to wait a couple more seconds because I want to get a full response here about what you think the recommendations should be about this particular relatively common situation that the guidelines don't address at all. For 45. Okay. So I think, I think that's, I like that. So none of us want to say that it's, it's, well, maybe very few want to say it's recommended. If you don't do this, you're going to be in trouble, okay? No one wants to say it's not recommended. I mean, the evidence shows that there's clearly a benefit. To say if you're going to do that, you're also going to be in trouble. It's not recommended. And I think that, you know, two-thirds of us would say it's considerable and then it's reasonable about 2A. That happens all the time in the guideline committee, you know. We just don't, we can't really agree on whether it's 2A or 2B. And again, you know, I learned that 2A is a very strong recommendation. And 2B, it's kind of, you have some wiggle room. And I think that we oftentimes don't pay attention to 2Bs, but we probably should because you can have a long discussion about whether you want to switch that over to 2A or not. You should go back and find more data. And I read an article recently that said that, you know, for guidelines, we should only have class 1s and class 3s published. And the rest of it should be just thrown into an appendix somewhere. And that doesn't really seem like that's really smart because what are you going to do with class 1 and class 3? Like, those are few and far between, and they're obvious. You know, I think where the money is, is in class 2As and class 2Bs. This is where we need the most guidance at the bedside. You know, I'm not sure how to handle the situation. It's nice to see what a body of experts may think, or I might need to talk to our friends and see what you might do. I think putting class 2As and 2Bs somewhere else is a mistake. So this is another individual. This is Gordon Moore. So Gordon Moore is the founder of Intel. Okay? He wrote a famous paper in electronics in 1965. My subscription ran out. And he came up with what was called now Moore's Law. And Moore's Law says that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit will double every two years. Okay? Microprocessors get better. They get smaller. Okay? So our old computers with vacuum tubes, you know, I have my Mac Classic in the basement, that kind of thing with a 9-inch screen you carry around. And now we have these small smartphones and embedded processors the number of circuits gets doubled and things get smaller and cheaper. And I think that the human genome is a perfect example of this, where you actually can sort of sequence the whole thing in a few hours for a trivial amount of money. And learning about this a little more, there's actually more processing power in our phones than all of NASA used for its 1960s moon landings. We've really come a long way as far as transistors in a circuit. But you know, I'm not a computer scientist. I don't even understand you know, what these things are all about. So how do my processors play into clinical medicine? Are they a clinical science? The answer is probably not. There's a lot of similarity between Moore's Law and what goes on in guideline development today. And the clinical practice guidelines are evolving. Again, we've had more and more and more in the past few years than we can even count and keep up with. And again, and oftentimes, I've learned that someone told me once that it takes about eight years for a guideline to come out and be disseminated into the community. But you're also having guideline updates every five years. And so you're learning something that's going to be updated and almost obsolete. It's impossible enterprise to put up with that. Guidelines are more complex. There's more diagnostic and therapeutic options. You guys learned about the Watchman device a few years ago that came out, it was used, and the FDA ever called it, it's being used again. We're learning more and more data. So updates are inevitable. And the question is how best to get these things out to our clinicians who have increasing time and productivity demands. That's the challenge for any guideline developer, I think. It's how best to efficiently maintain, update, and disseminate these guidelines that are consistently updated for busy frontline clinicians. So we can return to the statesman, okay? I think the state, you know, Plato would say, you know, how are effective healthcare by guideline, you know, it turns out to be, and I think he was, conceived, he was prepared to conceive its potential, it remained in its base form of practice. The base, you didn't like it. Because overall, you know, the hallmarks of expertise include a responsiveness and the ability to improvise at the bedside. And this approach to practice was in danger by the guidelines that he sort of set forth. And so the visitor says to his student, 
We must believe that the lawmaker who is to watch over the herds and maintain justice will never be able to, by making laws for all collectively, to provide exactly that which is proper for each individual. You see, you can't sort of say for the average patient that applies to your N of 1. That's easy. And I think that the student would say, yeah, probably not at any rate. So I want to sort of to conclude with some recommendations. And this is actually, I think the point I'm trying to make is that there's, you need to have some guidelines for reading guidelines. It's extremely difficult. So I think that, you know, for class one, I think that, you know, I'm, not, I'm trying not to be skeptical. I think that, you know, frontline clinicians, everybody who practices should know the basics of their society guidelines. You know, I'm talking only about ACCHA, but we have a lot of them, you know. You should know the guidelines. That helps you. That sort of informs what could be considered best practice, you know. A lot of discussion about guideline-based medical therapy. What does that sort of mean? And I think that guideline-based medical therapy, if you get dinged for that, it's hard to know what went into that decision-making. You know, there's a lot more. The minds of the guideline writers are actually not at the bedside with your patient. Another class one recommendation would be saying that, you know, I think it's important to understand how the guidelines are developed, the reasons for the change and the durability, how the classes and levels of evidence are sort of distinct, and, you know, it's recommended to know this before you're actually applying them to practice. I think it's reasonable, excuse me, considerable. I think that, you know, how to maintain these things to, at the bedside and update them is unclear. You know, we have them on our iPhones now. You can have them in your small things you can keep in your coat pocket. But again, it's very, very difficult. I don't want to end with a class three recommendation. That would be sort of a down note. But I think it's important to remember that these guidelines are not one size fits all. I think that assuming that it's best practice is dangerous. I think that again, what Plato liked was the fact that the, you know, you're going to check your, your the mind frame of the clinicians. But again, you have to be able to, to sort of improvise. He actually gave a story in the Statesman here, which is a great read about a doctor who prescribes something, and his patient changes. And what's he going to do? He's going to keep on the same prescription or is he going to change? That ability to, to modify your treatment. So again, I think that we'll conclude here. Um, I want to acknowledge several people. I made 14 new friends in the guideline, okay? Rick Page is a tremendous mentor in this process, a great leader. It's really nice to sort of see him again. Whether I was there in a fraudulent way or not, we'll never know. But I, I have my name in hard print, okay? Several of these individuals I continue to collaborate and work with today, they're all outstanding. It was a really, really educational experience. And it was a pleasure to speak to you guys. I gave a grand rounds three years ago on Valentine's Day. Today is St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> trying to find, you know, I don't know whatever colors there are out there, but hopefully I'll see you again soon. Thanks. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Hi. Uh, I saw Jeff Dreesen give a grand round several years ago about the kind of behind the scenes workings at New England Journal, and I thought this lecture was equally educational. And thank you so much for that. I ask you to go back to that slide about complications of catheter ablation of, of a flutter. <coughs> the table? Yeah. Is that it? This is the one you wanted to see? Uh, the, the one about risk of death and, and um, pacemaker. Yeah, is, is this actually your experience? Is it, I, I'm, no. I'm a generalist and I've never seen this, but I feel like I would never again send a patient for a, a you know, unless they were on the risk no, of cardiovascular no, this, collapse. This is not my experience at all. And my colleagues in the audience would say that this is a very rare thing. And this is one series of patients, you know, I think the patients are they're elderly, and I'm not really sure this is then not in the United States, but again, I think these numbers are a little bit elevated. And the question is you know, why that might be is worth looking into. But I see Jordan Pruckin. Would you just want to comment on that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these numbers are way out of proportion to what we usually quote patients. Um, you know, usually for death or an atrial flutter ablation, I'll quote someone about one in a thousand maybe. Um, if you look at some of the big registry studies, Medicare data, some of the California state data, I'll tell you that. In my hundreds of patients that I've done flutter ablations on, I can only think of one patient who died who was in class four heart failure on mill renown, and it was a Hail Mary type thing. Uh, pacemakers, we usually quote people about one in 200. The issue is, the question in terms of risk of pacemaker, is it due to the ablation itself? So are you ablating the AV node or the pathway inputs into the AV node, or is the underlying disease and sinus node dysfunction the issue? So are you converting some out of flutter, but they don't have a good sinus node underneath it? 
Um, and so, so that I think is part, so it speaks to that fact that exactly. you have a resting bradycardia, the photo mask is the only thing keeping you at a rate that's susceptible. I mean, they unmask a cold stick sinus syndrome by getting them back into sinus. I think that, you know, again, this is the kind of thing, you know, looking at the chart that I sent in the guidelines, you know, with, this is Jordan's experience. Most of the people in the audience and in the guideline committee were surprised by this number because this is what a 2009 meta-analysis spoke to. But again, I think this chart, this chart needs to be revised for CTI-dependent atrial flutter, which is the most common form. But again, that's why we have updates. So I appreciate your, your concern. It's not a risk-free enterprise, but in good hands, it's usually very successful. I think that was a, a great talk and highlighted some of the challenges of writing guidelines. And I guess the question, you know, going forward is, you know, we go to all this work to write these guidelines, and I think they're getting better trying to look at the evidence and trying to make recommendations that are appropriate. But, you know, how does this actually impact clinical practice? Because, you know, I can't fit all 53 cardiology guideline books in my white coat pocket. And even if I put it on my, on my iPad or my phone, I can't look at all 53 apps. And I can't remember all the class one recommendations. And it's even, you know, if I'm not a cardiologist, if I'm a general internist, then it's even more hopeless. And more than one society writes guidelines. And so do I just go with ACCA J1, or do I go with the other societies right. that are also writing guidelines often about the same diseases? So when I'm in there in the room with the patient, how do I use the guidelines? What's the future? I mean, what do you, you're the future, so what are you going to make happen so that when I'm sitting there with a patient, I actually know what the guidelines are. I mean, I think that's that's a really important point. It's, it's a huge challenge. I mean, this is the problem. You know, we have even things like blood pressure. There are societies that say different things all the time. Lipid guidelines differ between the lipid guidelines and the ACC. It's hard to know and hard to keep up with it. I don't have a good answer for that, honestly. I think it's a real challenge. And I think that there's got to be a better way. Um, you know, we, we try to make things as accessible as possible by making flowcharts and keeping them on the phone, but there's no way to really keep up with that, you know? I think that it's, it's sort of, um, I'd like to, I, I don't have a good answer. I think that's one of the challenges now. We can't say we're not going to do any more guidelines because it's enough is enough. It's not appropriate. There's more technologies that develop all the time. Um, I mean, more predicted this itself. You know, I think that he's saying it's a boom. You have better things that are happening, but again, I don't have a good answer, but you know, I think it's important that, that you know, that in an academic center we have an advantage because they're exposed to things, people in training, young people coming up that they have a better handle on it, who can challenge the old guidelines and then form our colleagues at the bedside. But again, I think it's really important to sort of be aware of that, you know, you look at the guideline that came out yesterday, maybe in months there's gonna be an update that sort of contradicts that. So Zach, that was great. Uh, Really great. So tying into actually your last comment you just made there, what do you think the role is for um, you know, more frequent updates, let's say? You know, this was a dozen years since the last guideline, and you know, SVT, I can't say that there's been a huge amount of information, but if you take the hypertension issue you just talked about, you have the SPRINT study that just came out. What do you think the role is for more frequent updates, or is that a bad thing to do, sort of more focused frequent updates? I mean, that's a great question. I think it's kind of two-sided. You know, you can, you'll update the guidelines for hypertension based on the SPRINT trial, We'll update heart failure based on the TopCat trial. Some people hate those trials. Some people really love them. And I guess the question is, you know, who's interpreting that evidence? Who's the chair of the guideline committee? Who's on that interpreting that evidence? Are more updates better? I don't even know if that's really the case, but you're kind of obligated to do that because if you ignore that, you have a guy that says, well, this is how we treat hypertension, and you don't cite the SPRINT trial, and you don't have a level of evidence A now, it's hard to know what to make of that. But at the same time, as you noted, we have an update now that's coming out what do I do with that old evidence that's actually taken a long time for us to understand? It's highly problematic. I think that it's very important, as I said at the end, to understand what the guidelines are and to try as the best you can to stay abreast of these things. Again, we get notifications on our phones, oh, there's a new guideline, you know, click here. That may be fine, but again, I think this is very challenging and almost dangerous if you keep having more guidelines, but I think it's necessary. There's no way to sort of be able to be as evidence-based as you can without updates. I mean, C was mentioning that he just, or that, Catherine was mentioning that she just finished a focused update of the Valor guidelines that just came out. And that was 2014. But now we have an update, 2016. I don't know what the update's going to say, but again, how am I going to understand that? I mean, if I hadn't ran into you in the hallway, I would never have known. Maybe I would have, I don't know. So um, I, I would say, I just want to say a couple things. I've, I've been fortunate or unfortunate enough to be involved since that left-hand side of your uh, timeline for the ACC guidelines. And I think the whole nature of guidelines, first of all, has changed. You know, I think once upon a time they were 
flow diagrams that people somehow thought they could follow an algorithm and treat a patient in that way. And I think your point is that very few patients are the modal patient who fit nicely into those flow diagrams. And I think what they become is a repository of the best um, summary of the evidence as it currently existed at the time that the guideline was written. And it is the place where you could go to look at that assembly of evidence. And I now look at them really as the platform on which you now can build other products like the pocket guide you said, you know, um, increasingly it will be computerized code that, you know, is in electronic health records, apps on your phone. Um, I, I think, you know, most practitioners will not go back and read those guidelines. The specialists will because they, they know that stuff and use it every day. So um, I think, you know, we just, you know, my rule has always been, can it be put into code? Because if it can't, then it's probably not going to be useful. Um, and as, as far as the updates go, there is a process in place. So the, the, the writing committees every year look through all the literature that's been written. Um, we ad identify studies that might be relevant. We vote on their relevance. And we ask the question, is it likely that this would change one of the current recommendations? And if that's the case, then the consideration comes forth as to whether an update is um, indicated. You know, with the ischemic heart disease guideline, we actually started, we, we published the guideline, the last one, in September and started the update in December because there had been a study. What happens is you have to have a cutoff date for when you'll no longer consider the articles that is actually long before the publication date because of the process. Um, and I'm going to say one more thing about the process and I'll shut up. Um, but the, uh, so we started right then and it was a new trial of cabbage in patients with diabetes and heart failure, which caused us to upgrade a 2A recommendation to a class one recommendation for cabbage in those patients. So, and that was based on that process. So my sense is, you know, the, 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 the rewriting of a guideline is sort of a, a like you take your car in for the 50,000 mile, you know, big overhaul and then, you know, you do checkups along the way and see if things need to be repaired. The last one, uh, the cartoon you showed earlier about the, the sequence of guideline rating, it is in no way reality. It is a complicated process with, um, I think we got, there, we, our guideline went through at least four to five rounds of public comment of various sorts. We got thousands, literally thousands of, re, of comments and you know, uh, reviewer comments that each one of them had to be individually addressed. Uh, the work that goes into these guidelines, particularly the more expansive ones like the one you've been describing, is it's hard to describe and it's all volunteer work and largely done by people who are prohibited from having relationships with the vendors who have um, interests in the guideline that you're writing. And sometimes that they're hard to find. They have to be, you know, sort of ignorant general internists who, um, you know, the, the, the company, the pharmaceutical companies don't want to support. So, um, but I, it's a lovely talk and I, I'd love a copy of it to disseminate to the, the guideline committee at ACC and HA. Well, why I actually like, like to ask the question myself, you know, just I see trainees in the front row and, and based on what, I don't want to put you guys on the spot, you know, nice to invite me to speak on it. I mean, I, I would do that again if I asked you a question, but, you know, based on what you've heard, like, you know, you're now in a position where you're going to become practitioners and guidelines are going to matter. Do you see challenges with dissemination, updates, getting them widely disseminated and affecting your practice? Do you have any solutions? I don't, I don't, if you know. what, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think the trick is um, making it, <clears throat> it's such a complex set of guidelines and making it simple enough to be used in a, in a clinic. And some guidelines that a primary care doc can follow, things that follow what the specialist has laid out. And so I think that's the biggest challenge going forward, thinking about what we've heard already, being in a clinic visit with a single patient and having thousands of guidelines to sort through. I think that's the biggest challenge that I see is just sorting through information um, you know, over the next 20 years. Thanks a lot.